Hi everybody, my name is Amanda Waddell and I'm going to talk to you guys today about part one of plastic pollution education. And this is brought to you by the Repurpose Project in collaboration with Zero Waste Gainesville. Part one is called, What is the Big Deal About Plastic? And this is part one of a four part plastic pollution education program. And like I mentioned, the Repurpose Project put this together uh, with Zero Waste Gainesville, Break Free from Plastic and Five Gyres. And here's the big deal about plastic. Globally, 380 million metric tons of plastic is produced annually. The entire plastic lifestyle poses health risks, is a social and environmental justice issue and contributes to climate change. And we will talk about all of that. And these top six bullets are really what we're gonna go into. And uh, I could probably talk about an hour on each one of these bullets, but instead I'm gonna give you an overview and hopefully this program will be less than an hour long total. And then I'll mention parts two, three, and four of this program. So I have a background as an ecologist, but several years ago I transferred into the zero waste world and I'm pretty lucky to be the director of zero waste at the Repurpose Project. I help run Zero Waste Gainesville. I'm a Break Free from Plastic Corps member, and that is why um, part of the reason why I brought you this program. But I have experience working with small businesses and schools and events and getting them on the path to zero waste. And I really, really enjoy doing education and outreach on plastic pollution and zero waste. And that's one reason why I created this program. So if you're not familiar with the Repurpose Project, it's a creative reuse center here in Gainesville, Florida. They uh, take in donations and then they resell the used items and their mission is to divert usable material from the landfill and really to help you think about resources and what you buy and all the stuff that is in your life. But they have an amazing array of stuff for sale, a lot of building supplies. They do have office and school supplies. They have um, some holiday items as well and I encourage you to check them out. For Zero Waste Gainesville, uh, what we do, that is a community program and it's not a nonprofit. So the Repurpose Project is a nonprofit, but Zero Waste Games, we're a community group and we really have two main focuses. One is to do the education and outreach throughout our community. And the other one is to get the city and county working towards zero waste, which they are doing. So we're real excited about that. So the first section is called, what is plastic? So we're gonna go through the basics here. So plastic really is a synthetic material. It's made from a variety of polymers and it can be molded, it can be shaped, it can be soft and then set. But plastic contains a lot of chemicals and endocrine disruptors that we'll talk about later. And 99% of plastic is created from fossil fuels. Most recently, it's really created from natural gas in the United States. Plastic is very cheap to produce has great versatility and a range of functions and it lasts forever. And that's part of the reason why it's so successful as a material, unfortunately. Just a little bit about the history of fossil fuel because that is what plastic is made from. And for the most part, since the industrial revolution, we've had the use of coal, oil, and now natural gas, which is found within our earth. It's a, a resource that is obtained within our earth and then we use it to produce energy to be able to do all of the stuff that we can do. But another thing is that fossil fuels make plastic and for the last couple decades it's really been natural gas that is what produces our plastic in the United States. And this is what they produce. These are called nurdles. These are the building blocks of plastic. They can also create flakes or other types of dust or pellets, but this is really the building block. So when you get these nurdles, these nurdles are then taken and produced into bottles or bags or toys or whatever plastic item. Um, the history of plastic, I think is real interesting. And in the late 1800s, early 1900s, a lot of people experimented because they want to, wanted to replace naturally made items. So long ago, our combs and other products like that were made from tortoise shells or ivory, but they didn't feel that that was sustainable because they didn't want to keep using animal products. So they created these synthetic materials and a lot of them didn't catch on, weren't quite right. But you can see the four really early types of plastic and we still use nylon today. 
Uh, but between the wars, World War I and World War II, there was a, an explosion of plastic created. The polystyrene and polyethylene were first produced in the 30s. And polyethylene really is a plastic that um, is widely, widely made into so much of the stuff we use today. The plastic was used extensively in World War II. Um, it really helped the war to be successful. They made parachutes, bombs, and more stuff. But after the war was over, these plastic factories remained. And there was a push for consumers to produce products that were traditionally made from durable material, but instead made of plastic now. So in the 1950s, polypropylene and expanded polystyrene were created. So they were still coming up with new plastics, even in the 50s. But in the 50s, there was a huge surge of cheap plastic produced. And there was also a marketing to create a culture change. So previously, uh, there was a culture of thrifting, of using reusables, um, of valuing resources. But in the 50s, that really changed. Um, there was a push to embrace a disposable lifestyle. And it took a while for this to be successful. But here are some marketing pictures from back in the 50s. So again, they wanted to change the culture from a durable culture, one that where they valued resources to one where they uh, embraced a disposable lifestyle. So in many ways, that's what us zero wasters want to, um, to change back. We want to change back the culture to one where we value resources, we avoid single use of any material, and instead we embrace reusables and durable material. A little bit more about the history of plastic. In the 1970s, the plastic industry knew that plastic recycling was not really economically viable. And they also knew that plastic degrades over time when you recycle it. There was a push for community to start a recycling program in the 70s because they really stopped, saw that plastic was piling up. There was, it wasn't really good to just throw it away. So they started these recycling programs even though they knew that recycling wasn't the answer. So basically they just wanted to keep making plastic. They wanted to do this in the 70s and every decade since, including today, the plastic industry just wants to keep making plastic. So in the 80s and 90s, the plastic industry spent millions on advertising. They showed the benefits of plastic and they also began putting those chasing arrows with the resin numbers on all plastic. It didn't matter if it had a viable recycling market or not. So this was misleading information there was zero responsibility from the plastic producers, and they shifted the blame onto consumers and communities for the problems with plastic. So these are the types of plastic. There are more types in this, but this is mostly what we see on um, packaging and plastic products. So number one through seven. And the numbers give you an indication of recyclability, and they also tell you a little bit about what they're made of. So they talk they tell you a little bit about the toxicity as well. But I like to talk about them as, um, you know, the more toxic ones versus the less toxic ones, the more recyclable ones versus the less recyclable ones. So one, two, four, and five um, are the least toxic and more recyclable. And number three, six, and seven should be avoided. Those are not good plastics. They're not good for uh, the folks who have to create them. So that's very far upstream with the occupational hazards. They're not good for you, the consumer, and they're not good for disposal. There's no end markets for them. They're not recyclable. Uh, polystyrene number six is really the worst offender in my opinion. If any plastic could stop being produced, I would really push for number six. I don't think it should be made. I don't think it should be used. And it definitely does not, um, it's not included in any way, shape or form, doesn't fit into our environment. Number seven historically was just other. So when we started making bioplastics like PLA, they just kind of lumped that in with seven. So we're gonna talk about that separately. But so number one and two are generally the kinds that are most recyclable and we'll talk about that later, but just because it has a number one and two on it does not mean it's recyclable generally only bottles and jugs. Containers with necks have a recycling market. Four and five are also recyclable, but sometimes some communities just don't produce enough um, to be able to sell them. So that's, that's a little bit on those. But bioplastics are the 1%. Remember, 99% of plastics are made from fossil fuel. Well, 1% are not. They're made from 
basically new carbon. They're made from uh, plant products that are new. So there's really two different types, bio-derived plastic. This is one, it's actually a mixture of fossil fuel and plant feedstock. They are not biodegradable or compostable. They are still recycle, recyclable in a traditional recycling stream. And one example is the plant bottle that Coke put out and they said that they put 30% of plant material in with the normal fossil fuel plastics. But the one we're seeing more of is biopolymers. And these they say are plastics that are biodegradable. They are compostable in an industrial scale compost facility. So these do not go in your recycling bin. They do not get recycled in the normal recycling uh, stream. Well, one example is the PLA, the plant derived plastic. So you will see a number seven on these types of plastic. The problem with uh, any bioplastics, even if they're not made from fossil fuels, the problem with them is they're still uh, contributing to the culture of disposables, of just using things once and throwing them away. They contain additives like other plastics do, and they also act like normal plastics. If they get into the environment, they break up into smaller and smaller pieces, and they can absorb pollutants if there are, in, if there are pollutants in the aquatic ecosystem. So just a little differentiation. Most of this talk is about single-use plastics. Long-life plastics um, have really helped out our, our the way we live. It, they really have. I really do think that long-life plastics should have an end-of-life plan, though. They should not be going to an incinerator or a landfill. The problem with any plastic is there's just not really any good end-of-life plan. But for the most part, we're talking about single-use plastics and packaging right now. So plastic production. This is uh, our next big topic that we're going to talk about now. And uh, Geyer et al. put out a paper in 2017, and he estimated, and his team estimated, that in 2015, 9 billion tons of plastic had been produced. So this is really from the start of industrial plastic being mass produced, which happened in the 1950s. So between the 1950s and 2015, he estimated 9 billion tons of plastic had been produced. And he also estimated that two thirds of that plastic was waste, meaning that one third was still in use. So that's probably the long life plastics. So two thirds had become waste. Only 9% had been recycled, 12% incinerated, and 79% accumulated in land, uh, landfills or in our environment. And I think that those numbers should be shocking to everybody. But also shocking, the plastic industry wants to expand. They want to invest over 200 billion into the plastic manufacturing just in the United States. And they want to quadruple plastic production in 2050. Remember what I said, they want to just keep making plastic. So this is a graph I took from the US EPA talking about plastic waste management, what we do in the United States with all the plastic that is produced. And you can see from 1960 when there was barely any to manage to 2017, which is the year that they um, tell us the most recent data that they have on plastic waste. You can see that the majority of plastic in the United States gets landfilled. A small percentage gets combusted with energy recovery. I am not a fan of incineration or any combustion, even if there's energy recovery. I don't, that's a destructive disposal system and we shouldn't be doing that. Of course, no plastics composted and just a small sliver is recycled. So we uh, need to work on this. So plastic is incredibly cheap to produce. And this is mostly because the fossil fuel industry has large subsidies. They have subsidies in the United States and around the globe. So that creates an artificially low cost of plastic. But what's the true cost of plastic? The cost you don't see, but there are health concerns. There are occupational costs. So think about all the workers that are working in the factories that create the plastic. There's a cost to consumers. There's a huge environmental cost and cost to communities, but none of that is factored in. So plastic has an artificially low cost. So plastic and health. This is a, a really big section. This is really important, plastic and health. So this graph is taken directly from CL's report, Plastic and Health, and CL does amazing reports, and I encourage you to look at that one for more information. But this graph basically shows that plastic affects our health on, along all parts of the plastic lifestyle, life cycle. So 
plastic, um, there's occupational hazards, like I mentioned. So the people that are doing the extraction and transport, the people who are doing the refining and manufacturing, they're exposed to health hazards when making plastic. The consumer, we have health issues, and we're going to go into that a little bit more. And then the waste management, incineration, there's a lot of health issues <clears throat> with people working in the incineration field. So there are chemicals in plastics. We're going to talk about three, BPA, phthalates, and styrene. These chemicals can leach into your food and drink from the plastic packaging. And I think that's really important to remember. And I always tell people not to microwave in plastic and don't put plastic in your dishwasher if you do have it. But let's talk about BPA first, but bisphenol A. It's an industry chemical used in the production of many plastics, and it really does make plastic clear and tough. But BPA was created in the early 1900s as a birth control. It absolutely was designed to affect a, a woman's hormone system, but it didn't work really well. So, so they stopped using it as birth control, but they decided to put it in plastics because they found another use for it. Well, BPA is an endocrine disruptor. It's a chemical that may interfere with the body's endocrine system and produce adverse development, reproductive, neurological, and immune effects in both humans and wildlife. And I wanted to mention that specific definition because you might not know what an endocrine disruptor is, but it affects the hormones in humans and wildlife. BPA has been banned from baby bottles and sippy cups, and that's because of an outroar, consumer outrage. So it just shows that consumers can drive markets, they can change things. But unfortunately, if BPA is taken out, they have to use another chemical to make uh, that plastic still be clear and tough. It definitely leaches from products into the plastic. It's been linked to cancer, obesity, ADHD, thyroid and heart disease, and BPAs and other stuff, not just plastic, but in register receipts, CD cases, and, and inside the lining of metal cans. So that's real stuff. Um, our human bodies, we do shed BPA, meaning it's not, it doesn't live a long life um, inside of us, but if we constantly uh, get BPA in our system, if we're constantly exposed to it, then we will keep a level of BPA. So phthalates, they're oil derived plastic esters or a chemical. It's basically a plasticizer, increases the flexibility, the transparency, durability and longevity of plastics. So one example, um, number three PVC shower curtains, they have phthalates in them. And I encourage you not to get a plastic shower curtain. That's just one example of a plastic that commonly has phthalates in it. Phthalates are also an endocrine disruptor, meaning they can affect the hormone system in humans and wildlife. They're banned in some children's store toys, but the problem is there are tons of types of phthalates. They're linked to diabetes, cancer, reproductive system issues, and they're also in many personal care products um, listed as fragrance. They're in lotions and air fresheners and other stuff. So styrene. Styrene is another chemical that I think that we should talk about for a few minutes. It's a neurotoxin and a probable carcinogen. Styrene is in the number six plastic, polystyrene and expanded polystyrene. So the thing about polystyrene, it can be in a rigid form, it can be clear or it can be colored, it's often black. It can also be in the expanded form, which is what you guys um, often know of as styrofoam. But this is a social justice issue. There's an occupational hazard with styrene. The people who are in these factories making these plastics for people to use, um, it's just not fair to them. It's incredibly inexpensive for the reasons that we previously talked about. The expanded polystyrene breaks apart incredibly easily and becomes litter and microplastics really quickly in our environment. Dow Chemicals are the ones who developed and trademarked styrofoam, but yet they take no responsibility for the end of life of any of their uh, styrofoam products. This picture was taken by, from Megan Black when she was the executive director of Current Problems, and she and I visited some trash traps around town, and she collected these polar pop cups from those trash traps and other areas um, that were littered in Gainesville, and she set up this display and took this picture. Polar pop cups are expanded polystyrene. It's an incredibly cheap way to buy your soda and you might drink out of it for um, 20, 30 minutes at the most, and then it becomes trash. Uh, it's something that will la last in the environment forever. It so easily escapes into our environment because this type of plastic, like so many, is lightweight when it's empty. 
So is plastic recyclable? It's important to talk about plastic recycling, definitely. So recycling isn't the answer, but we definitely need to talk about it. So is plastic recyclable? Yes and no. So like we talked about before, only about 9% of the global plastic has ever been recycled. If you look at these bales, they're bales of plastic bottles, PET, the polyethylene terephthalate, those will go to a plastic mill and they will get shredded most likely. And that is a process called mechanical recycling, where you get the feedstock, um, you tear it down into smaller and smaller pieces, and then you again have the building blocks to make new types of plastic. And I think it's important to note that plastic is generally downcycled, meaning bottles don't, don't become bottles. If they did, that would be a closed loop system. But generally bottles become flakes and then added to um, products like carpet or clothing or something. Uh, and that's a process called downcycling. So I created this chart based on some US EPA data uh, from 2017, which is the year of the most recent data that they put out talking about the United States, what we do with our materials, just to show plastic in comparison to glass and paper and the metals. And you can see other than paper, plastic was the most produced out of all of these. We, in the United States, 35.4 million tons were generated in 2017 alone. And a very small sliver of that, the orange bar on this stacked uh, bar graph, only 3 million tons were recycled. 5.6 million ton combusted for energy. That is what is incineration. Incineration, again, it's a destructive disposal technique that should not be used. And 26.8 million tons of plastic in the United States in 2017 was landfill. There's so many reasons for that, but the number one reason is that there's so much plastic that is created that does not have an end of life plan, meaning there's nothing you can do with it. So it just has to be landfill. And plastic is different from all of these materials, but the glass, paper, and the metals, they can be recycled back into their same products for many, many times. Gla glass and metals indefinitely, paper does have, um, can only be recycled so many times, but the plastic is just such a different story than the other materials, and that's really why we're talking about it now. So as we talk about Plastic recycling in Alachua County, just think of all the plastic that comes into your life and think about, is it really recyclable? But what we can recycle in Alachua County is if you live in a single family home and have curbside recycling, really the only things that they say that they accept are number one and number two, the PET and the HDPE bottles. Uh, they can be colored or they can be clear, but these are things that have necks. So that's really the only things that we can effectively recycle in Alachua County. And if you talk to recycle, recyclers, they say the same thing pretty much um, nationwide. They may say that they take all types of number one or all types of number two or even other numbers, but effective recycling really only happens with bottles that are number one PET or number two HDPE. Alachua County will take number four and number five, those are generally lids or yogurt or margarine tubs. And they really lump those in with what they call three through sevens. They do not take plastics number three, six or seven. They just kind of um, lump it together and take that. But where does our plastic go? So the number one PET, the polyethylene terephthalate bottles go to mills in North Carolina and Georgia and they're made into our PET flakes. So these bottles turn into flakes and these flakes are added to carpets or clothing or other polyester products. So this is a, not a closed loop system. This is what we call downcycling. So a single use plastic turned into a long life plastic. And then that long life plastic doesn't really have an end of life plan. The number two HDPEs, they also go to mills in North Carolina and Alabama, and they're made into flakes or pellets, and they're put into different things, um, pipes, um, plastic lumber, possible toys, and those kind of things. And there is a market for those, meaning they these mills that buy our number ones and our number twos do pay for them. So in 2000, uh, in May of 2020, you know, our number one PET bottles were selling for $100 a bale. Number twos were selling for um, the natural color, not, not the colors 
but, um, but the natural was selling for even $740 for a bale of number two. So there are markets for those. There is no value for the three through seven bales and Alachua County has a hard time finding mills that will take these. But, but most recently I talked to the MRF manager out there that is the material recovery facility and they were giving these plastics to a mill in Georgia. So it's important to talk about single-use plastic bags because these are in the news a lot. We hear a lot about the bans. So I just wanted to, to talk about single-use plastic bags because in America, we use and dispose over 100 billion single-use plastic bags annually. On average, single-use plastic bags are used for 12 minutes and only around 5% are recycled. You cannot recycle them in your curbside bin, but there are drop-off locations at stores. Most single-use plastic bags are made from number four, so that's a low-density polyethylene. And uh, they're often used to make the plastic lumber. So a lot of places have banned single-use plastic bags. And they've done this because they see that these bags escape into the environment so easily. They're used for a short period of time, and there are such good alternatives. And eight states have banned them, and the most recent one is New Jersey. So the governor hasn't signed that yet. But if they do, New Jersey will have a really um, strict statewide ban, and it bans single-use paper and plastic bags. And that's really what zero wasters want. We don't want single use of any material. We want reusables and durables use. So the alternative is a durable cloth bag to use instead of any single use material. That's what's really important. So plastic and COVID, I just want to mention this real quick because if you're like me and grew up in the 80s and 90s, you remember people telling you to cut your six pack rings because they could escape to the environment and they can entrap wildlife just like the picture on the right. Well, unfortunately, I guess that's happening with the single use masks that the, if you don't cut the straps, they are entangling birds legs. So with COVID, please cut the straps if you use disposable masks. Um, but there are so many good reusable mask alternatives. And what we really want in general is to reduce all use of disposables and increase the use of reusables. So I put this picture in as just a, a halfway point and just to stop and appreciate why we're talking about this. I, I do the zero waste work I do because of my connection to nature and love of animals. And I took this picture of a manatee and alligator swimming together um, over 20 years ago. I saw it at Blue Springs State Park, the one in Volusia County. And I was just incredibly excited. I couldn't believe a manatee and an alligator were swimming together. It just made me so happy. And I know the picture quality is very poor, but I still wanted to bring that to you because this is why, um, this is my motivation. And I want you to find your motivation and maybe it's also wildlife, um, but it could be a variety of things. Okay. All right, plastic pollution is the next segment and this is a big one and this is a really important one. So we're gonna talk about plastic pollution. So this is the plastic lifestyle life cycle or the plastic supply chain. And it really could be any material supply chain. But basically we get our resources from the earth and then we have to take those resources and turn them into products or packaging. Then they go to a store. We as consumers buy the stuff, we take it to our house and then we dispose of it. So this is the basic supply chain and we're gonna talk about it with plastic. But there are plastic emissions that affect our climate, environment, and human health during all of these steps. And that is very, very important. The other thing to know is I'm going to refer to upstream and downstream in this talk and possibly in others. So upstream is where we extract resources. And in the case of plastic, we, re we refine them and then we produce things out of the plastic. All that um, those processes along with transportation are all upstream. It becomes downstream when we buy them, when the consumer goes into a store and buys something or uses plastic packaging, that's downstream. We use it, we take it into, or we buy it, we take it into our home, we use it, uh, then we dispose of it. And when we dispose of it, it could go to a recycling facility, to a landfill or incinerator or into the environment. And those are really the choices downstream. So some plastic pollution upstream, important to talk about, is uh, at the refining facility, which happens all along the Gulf Coast, 
uh, air pollution is emitted from these factories. And that's a big deal. We're going to talk about that more in the climate change section. But also in any factory, they have wastewater. But with plastic factories, when they discharge this wastewater, there are often those plastic nurdles, flakes, and other plastic products in with the wastewater. And these factories don't take any care to contain them. And in fact, Formosa, a plastics manufacturing company in Texas, was sued in 2019 and they lost that lawsuit. So there was a group of environmentalists who had been um, taking samples of all of the nurdles. And you guys know what nurdles are now. They're the plastic spheres that are the building blocks to the plastic. They were finding these nurdles all in the, along the coast and, on, in the, and in the Texas waterways. So environmentalists got together and they created a program and they collected data on these nurdles for years and they actually sued Formosa and they won. So $50 million are going to these environmental organizations and Formosa has to figure out a way to discharge their waters without plastic in them. So the Nurdle Patrol was part of this um, winning lawsuit. And the Nurdle Patrol, uh, what they do is they get citizen scientists to go out and they look at a transect and they try and see if there's any nurdles there. And then they upload their data and they share it. So you can see this is along the Texas coast here and there's a lot of nurdles found. In fact, this is the area with Formosa. And along here, it gets less and less because we don't have any plastic factories, plastic plants, luckily in Florida. So the people who collected this, uh, that sued Formosa, they get a lot of that $50 million, which is pretty phenomenal. But unfortunately, this is a screenshot from um, a friend and colleague, Diane Wilson, who was part of that lawsuit in Texas. She was still, she is still surveying these areas around Formosa plastics in Texas. And unfortunately, even in September, 2020, she reported seeing um, pellets, flakes, and nurdles in the water around there. So that's very unfortunate that they're still discharging this. Other plastic pollution upstream comes along with fence line communities. So a lot of time these plastic plants, uh, they move into areas that are right beside communities. So where people live, where they go to school, where they play in parks and all along that. So there's a section called Cancer Alley from Baton Rouge to New Orleans. Uh, it's along the Mississippi River where these plastic factories have moved in for the last hundred years. But there were already communities living there. They're called fence line communities because they're exposed to the direct pollution upstream for all of the plastic that uh, we use day to day. And it's very unfortunate. And we're going to talk about St. James Parish in the post screening discussion. We're going to talk about them a little bit more. But plastic pollution downstream. So this is now we're downstream. So this really starts with consumption. So when people use stuff and then it gets thrown away. Really what happens, uh, like I mentioned, it can be recycled, plastic can go to landfills or incineration or get into the environment. But really plastic so easily escapes into the environment because single use plastic is so lightweight. Uh, scientists estimate that 80% of the plastic pollution is from land-based sources. And a new paper from Burrell et al. in 2020, so this is really, really new information, they estimated that between 19 and 23 million metric tons of plastic in our aquatic ecosystems each year. So this is freshwater and saltwater aquatic ecosystems. The problem is that plastic doesn't biodegrade. It never really goes away. Our environment can't absorb it. If paper gets into the environment, it can really break down into the basic building blocks. Our environment can absorb paper, for example, but it can't absorb plastic. So instead plastic, photo degrades, and that means it breaks down into smaller and smaller pieces. And once it's less than five millimeters in size, it's considered microplastics. So as a Five Dollars Ambassador, I like to really emphasize um, Dr. Erickson's work. He and his crews actually go out into the oceans and they sample the plastic in the oceans. And he and um, some folks wrote a paper in 2014 that uh, was peer reviewed published paper. And they estimated that on with all of their surveys that they have done, that there are 5.25 trillion particles of plastic weighing over 260,000 tons in our oceans. 
Obviously this is old data these days, so there's definitely more than that. But types of plastic in the ocean, so there's a lot of large plastic in the ocean. It's not all small, small pieces, but it begins as large and a lot of it's fishing gears, nets and traps. So this is some plastic that um, gets left abandoned or dropped into the ocean. And there's other bulk items, large toys and crates and other things like that and single use items that get into the ocean. These big plastics will become smaller plastics over time and be, become microplastics. Microfibers are another one. They're small pieces of plastic that were originally from large pieces of plastic clothing, and they also get into our waterways. The thing about plastic in the water that is so different from glass or metal is that persistent organic pollutants are attracted to plastic. Plastic will absorb these. If there are any toxins, toxins in the aquatic e ecosystems, they will get absorbed by the plastic, unfortunately. And then we all know that some animals do ingest the plastic. There are primary sources of plastic in the ocean and our, in our waterways, such as those nurdles and microbes. Fortunately, we have the Microbes Free Water Act that was signed into law in 2016. But previous to that, uh, um, several deodorants, facial scrubs, and other things, body scrubs, had microplastics in it. And these were the small beads that are pictured there. Uh, in America, that is outlawed, but obviously there's a lot of other countries that may still be putting microbeads in their uh, facial scrubs and stuff like that. So I want to mention plastic fashion, because this is a way that we get plastic pollution in our waterways, but basically clothing made from synthetic fibers. Uh, think of polyester clothing or um, a lot of people wear those yoga pants. So much yoga pants are worn. But when we wash clothes, all clothes, fibers get released from clothes. But again, if those fibers are from cotton or natural material, they will just get absorbed in our ecosystems and our waterways. And it's really not that big of a deal. They will biodegrade quickly over time. But these fibers from synthetic clothing, they don't get trapped in our washing machine. They don't get contained or trapped in our wastewater treatment plants. Instead, they go out with the water and these microfibers get into our waterways. And again, these are small plastic threads. So they kind of, you can see them with your naked eye, but they look like threads. They will also absorb um, the POPs, the persistent organic pollutants, and uh, wildlife can then eat the microfibers, unfortunately. But there was a new research in 2020, again, that estimated that 5.6 million metric tons of synthetic microfibers were emitted from washing synthetic clothes between 1950 and 2016. Unfortunately, that's, that's a lot. Some more plastic pollution downstream. Uh, marine debris Im impacts hundreds and hundreds of species of wildlife, and this can occur through ingestion or entanglement. And plastic debris accounts for 92% of all the marine debris encounters. So think about the albatross out in the Pacific Ocean. They are pelagic uh, bird species that forage in the oceans and they pick up plastic trash and the, that plastic trash ends up in their bellies and sometimes they feed it to their young. So that is ingestion. Entanglement and happens even in Florida locally. This is a picture of a manatee entangled. Manatees often get fishing line tangled around their flippers and most of the fishing line, fishing gears these days is made from nylon which is a type of plastic. So another local thing that scientists are seeing at the Whitney Laboratory, this is on the Atlantic side of the state of Florida, is they're seeing lots of turtles with plastic in their stomachs, unfortunately, small pieces of plastic. So plastic's really been found everywhere, in the Arctic, in the ocean trenches, in animals, in soil, and beer, in the air. Plastic's found in tap and bottled water, although it's found more in bottled water. It's found in salt. So plastic is really everywhere. It is pollution and it really just doesn't go away or it takes a really long time to actually go away. Our environment cannot absorb all of this plastic that has been produced. <clears throat> so plastic and climate change is the last section we're going to go through today. So plastic really does affect our climate along the whole supply chain, unfortunately. There are greenhouse gas emissions from the plastic life cycle, and they affect our climate in four major ways. So I'm going to talk about extraction and transport, 
refining and manufacturing, waste management, and plastic in the environment. So this graphic is from the USGS showing really how fracking works. And this is the extraction and then transportation of the material that makes plastic. And so when you have hydraulic fracturing, basically you're using water, sand, and other chemicals. Um, and they shoot this down a wellhead and that really releases the oil or the natural gas. And then they're able to con um, capture that and transport it off to be used for a variety of things. And one thing that they use it for is to create plastic. But we have greenhouse gas emissions from this process and sometimes they have to clear the land. So they have to remove mature trees that are storing carbon and we don't want that. It also takes a lot of energy to then capture this energy. And methane is often released. So methane is a greenhouse gas that is a lot more potent than just carbon dioxide, which is the normal greenhouse gas that we hear referred to. But methane can leak through this process. And also sometimes they have to flare it deliberately. They have to burn the methane. So refining and manufacturing. So this is specific to plastic. So refining takes place in what's called a cracker plant. So this is where the ethane, which is the natural gas liquid, is heated to a very high temperature to make ethylene. This ethylene is then pressured through polymerization to become polyethylene. So polyethylene is um, a big part of plastic. It makes up plastic number one, two, and four. And so they make a lot of polyethylene. And this is really how it happens in a cracker plant. But CL put out a, a pretty fantastic report called Plastic and Climate. And in 2015, they estimated that 24 ethylene factories in the US produce 17.5 million metric ton of CO2 equivalent emitting as much CO2, so that's carbon dioxide, as 3.8 million passenger vehicles. So when we say CO2 equivalent, it may not just be carbon dioxide that these cracker plants are emitting, but in order to give it to you in a good kind of summary type of way, they just give you the number of CO2 equivalents. So some of that could have been methane or nitrous oxide or the other types um, of greenhouse gases but they just put it as CO2 equivalent because carbon dioxide is really the main greenhouse gas that is warming our planet right now. So with waste management, you have a couple options for plastic. You can landfill plastic, you can recycle plastic, or you can incinerate plastic. Uh, with landfilling plastic, there's not a lot of greenhouse gas emissions, but there are other problems with landfilling plastic that we're not gonna talk about today. With recycling plastic, you have an emissions reduction. So we are gonna talk about that. But mostly when we talk about uh, uh, is incineration. Incineration is a destructive disposal measures and there are high emissions with incineration, not to mention that toxic emissions that happen. But here we're just talking about emissions that are warming our planet. So again, CL's report plastic and climate is pretty, um, fantastic report. And the US emissions in 2015 from plastic incineration estimated at 5.9 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent. So burning plastic contributes to climate change. That really is the bottom line. Burning plastic contributes to climate change. And then the fourth way that plastic contributes to climate change is really through it just being in um, our oceans or even on land. So Roy et al. in 2018 published a paper saying that when plastic break down on the ocean surface, they emit greenhouse gases, including methane. So that's a pretty horrific finding. But it's important to note that when plastic gets into the ocean, some of it does sink. And when it sinks to the bottom of the ocean, it'll most likely stay intact because there's no sunlight there for photodegradation. The wave action is much less and it's much colder down there. So the photodegradation that we talked about and then the methane releasing now is really the plastic on the surface where the sunlight can get to it, um, where it's warmer and where it's just really the, kind of the top part of the water column. So I did a greenhouse gas emissions analysis with some plastic um, through, I used the EPA warm tool. So I did a little bit of modeling and I looked at um, just one ton of these five different types of plastics. And I wanted to see 
the greenhouse gas emissions with one ton of landfilling plastic. And then you put in an alternative scenario. So my alternative scenario was um, source reduction. So if you source reduce one ton of all of these five different types of plastic, what were, there, what were the emissions reduction? So if you can see that small orange line, that is the greenhouse gas emissions from landfilling one ton of each of these types of plastic. And they're all at 0 0.02 metric ton CO2 equivalent. So that's not a whole lot, but we'll look at polystyrene as the one example in a little bit more detail because that is the type of plastic that I want source reduced. Polystyrene should not be made, it should not be consumed, it should not be used by us, and it definitely should not be in the environment. But there are green gas emissions with polystyrene upstream. But if you source reduce even one ton of polystyrene, you have a negative 2.5 metric ton CO2 equivalent. So that is the result. And what that means is when you get a negative value, that means an emissions reduction. So this is another stack bar chart, but it's um, you know a negative one. So it's a little bit different when you read these, but basically that yellow bar for polystyrene, really for all of them shows the emissions reduction. So with polystyrene, you have a negative 2.5. And if you want the total greenhouse gas emissions reductions, you can add that number to the 0 0.02 and that's really the green bar. So it's just showing if you, reduce, source reduce one ton of the polystyrene, you don't get the 0 0.02 emissions from landfilling because it's not created in the first place. And you get the upstream greenhouse gas reductions as well. So that's pretty uh, remarkable. And then I also wanted to do a greenhouse gas emissions analysis with the WARM tool again. So I modeled source reductions versus recycling to see which created the um, emissions, more emissions reductions. So unfortunately, the WARM tool can really only model recycling with number one plastic and number two, because there's only enough data for those. Number four, five, and six don't have big or any recycling markets. So there's not data to compare that. But you can see on number one and number two, that there are greenhouse gas emissions from the source reducing of one ton, which is the orange bar, and then the blue bar, or it's a uh, kind of a gray, gray bar, is the emissions reductions with recycling. So there are less emissions reductions with recycling versus source reduction. So it just goes to show you, if we want, really want to make a big impact with our climate change, we need to source reduce plastic. We need to stop making plastic for single use items 100%. But it is good to know that when we do recycle, there are some emissions reductions. This graph was taken directly from CL's report again. And remember how I told you that the plastics industry wants to expand. They want to keep making more plastic. And it just shows you that the emissions from the plastic lifestyle life cycle are going to increase if the plastics industry gets their way and they increase. And this is really going to affect our, our climate more warming gases are going to enter our climate and that's really not what we want. So congratulations, that's the end. Now you know why plastic is such a big deal. We really need to stop producing plastic. We need to stop it at its source. But there's no way to avoid all plastic, but here's a few things you can do. Continue with this program to raise your awareness. Reduce some plastic in your life, even if re you reduce some, that's great. And work to make change and support organizations who are working to break to make change. And remember to break free from plastic. So part two, we're all gonna watch the story of plastic. Part three, we're gonna have a post-screening discussion. So we're gonna discuss the film. We're gonna discuss the case study of St. James Parish, Louisiana. We're gonna talk about action items, things you can actually do, activities and pledges, and that's where you can get more involved and you can make commitments. And then part four, we're gonna talk about zero waste communities. And I'm incredibly, incredibly excited to talk about part four because this is where we talk about all these bullet points and more. And this is where we really create culture change. And really what I want to influence you guys is to help me create culture change where we value resources. We know that in nature, nothing is wasted. So that's what we try to do. Um, we avoid disposables and we work towards a reusable system, one that's equitable for all. 
So in zero waste communities, we want products that are designed for the environment. We want you to consume less stuff. We want policies in place for waste reduction. We want share and repair to become common. We want reuse systems to become common. Buy, use, shop at your thrift store. Um, help me create refill and reuse systems because they're rare, but we need to bring those back. Source separation is very important. We do need effective recycling and composting. And we need resource recovery parks that can help us meet our diversion efforts. And we're going to talk about all of this in part four. So thank you for being with me. And I look forward to seeing you in the next parts.